this lockdown has made a great deal of difference to us. We don't get out much at the best of times. <coughs> Being stuck inside all these months must be murder if you can't get on. But in our case, it's been plain sailing. If anything, we're closer now than we've ever been. And after 63 years of marriage, that's saying something. <laughs> Best decision I ever made, getting married to Claire. Don't mind admitting. She's the light of my life. It's just the two of us now. Don't get any visitors. Except the Meals on Wheels blow. Mind you, I can't make head nor tail of his accent. I mean, I'm sure he's doing his best, but his command of English leaves a lot to be desired. And to make matters worse, he turns up wearing a face mask. I can't think we'll have much to say to each other anyway. I tried to explain their mistake dozens of times. He just doesn't seem to take it in. We're both supposed to get a cup lunch every day, but for the last few months, we've only had one. The generous portion is mine. We're happy to share it. It's not that bad most days, as long as it's nothing fancy like risotto, pasta. Mind you, Claire's appetite is not what it was. I'd generally have to finish her half anyway. I was saying to her only this morning, what's the point in having someone in a job like that when they can't communicate? Especially when they're the only person I'm going to speak to from one week to the next. Other than Claire. Oh, I shouldn't grumble. As long as you've got one person to talk to, that's all you need, really. I used to have a chat with the checkout girls at the co-op on the corner, but they've all been replaced by machines. I still get to speak to the woman who sorts out any problems in the bagging area, which they usually are. Mind you, she's generally rushing off to sort out somebody else in difficulty. She's... Certainly not inclined to pass the time of day. We used to see Dr. Clarkson most weeks, especially with Claire's problem. But uh, that's all done over the phone now. Mind you, we've not spoken to him in months. There'd be a time... When we'd have neighbours dropping in all teen times a day, they're always coming and going. We've lived in this house since 1962. And we used to know everyone on the street and everything about them too. Postlethwaite's live next door. And then uh, on that side, the Bradshaws. How Stephen went to school with their Graham. The Hodgsons lived opposite and then... The Rileys, and then the Williams family at number 42. Then there was all Mrs. Gardner and that couple with the mentally handicapped son, the Faircloughs. And there wasn't a single one of them I wouldn't stop and have a chat with. When we went down the shops, we'd have to give ourselves a good half hour to get to the end of the street. <laughs> And there was a real sense of community. We even had a few street parties over the years, like um, the Queen's Silver Jubilee and the wedding of Charles and Diana, and then um, Prince Andrew and Fergie. Oh, that would have been the last one. Yeah, it's not that there's been no to celebrate since then, but the streets changed beyond recognition. All the old neighbours of Moved away or passed on. Every one of them. Gone. All gone. All gone. Nowadays, 
I don't know a single one of my neighbours. The Bangladeshi family this side, they can't speak a word of English. And on the other side, there's a Dutch couple. And I think they speak English, but their accent's so thick. Might as well be double Dutch for all I know. Same with them poles across the road. Most of the streets rented out now, and uh, the tenants don't seem to stay longer than a few months at most. Several of the houses are full of Romanians or Bulgarians or so on. I've heard that they sleep half a dozen to a room. So, one way or another, all the neighbours are strangers now. Not a single one of them would give me the time of day. <laughs> Even if we understood the same language. Several in the street used to work at Kirk Blight's back in the day. Our machine is there for the best part of five decades. I retired 16 years ago and within three years they'd shut up shop. Apparently they couldn't compete with the Chinese. Mind you, they'd been in decline since the 80s. By the time they finally went bankrupt, they were down to less than 400 staff. Still, it decimated the town. My whole life used to revolve around Kirk Bright. Virtually every one of my mates worked there as well. I've been going since 1908. Shame they didn't quite make their centenary. People used to say that they were the beating heart of the town. Hmm. Certainly I have activity. The machines thumping away ten hour a day. You had to shout to it yourself, think. It's all quiet now. Quiet as a grave. All gone. All gone. When Kurt Bryce went, the social club went as well. We spent many happy hour in there over the years, having a good chin wag over a pint. <laughs> I can't think when my last went out for a drink. Where would we go with? All our friends have passed on. That's the worst thing about getting to our age. Everyone you ever cared about, every one of them gone. Our closest friends were three couples we'd known since we were teenagers. Oh, oh, we'd have some fine times together. Day trips to Southport, Lytham St Anne's, up to the lakes. Even more come on one occasion. <laughs> Once was enough. And we had a few holidays abroad together after everyone's kids had grown up, usually to Spain or, or to France. We called ourselves the golden oldies. But they've all passed on now. Roy was first to go with cancer. And then Stan. And then Nora and Ray within a few months of each other. And then Celia, cancer again. And then Yvonne last Christmas. No, hang on. Christmas before last. Anyway, they've all gone. It's just the two of us now. All gone. All gone. Mind you, they might be all gone now, but that doesn't take anything away from all those happy times. We're thankful we had them. We're grateful for the memories. There's this notion that it's somehow desperately sad when your halcyon days come to an end. When you go into decline and you gradually lose everyone you ever cared about, everything you've ever valued, all the things that gave you happiness. But at least Claire and I had that at some point in our lives. 
That's the important thing. Don't matter when. It don't matter that it's coming to an end. Nothing lasts forever. Still, it's, it's a pity our Stephen won't have anything to do with us. He used to phone his mum once a week, but even that stopped now. Claire used to blame me because she doesn't get to see her grandchildren. Thankfully, she hasn't brought it up lately. Stephen and I never saw eye to eye, politically speaking. But it never came between us until about five years ago. I suppose we're both quite strong in our opinions. He's always had fancy ideas and going to university only made matters worse. To my mind, the university of life teaches you a hell of a lot more about the things that really matter. There was a time when we agreed to differ. But then all of a sudden, things became very acrimonious. He said that people my age shouldn't be dictating the future for the younger generation. According to Stephen, I have kicked our grandchildren in the teeth. He said, I've diminished their horizons. I don't know why they can't just get a job round here. There's no need for them to go off to Europe to study or to find work, even if they could. Mind you, their eldest, Shane, he's been out of work for over a year now since the cutbacks at Nissan. You'd have thought he'd have found something by now, wouldn't you? Trouble is the lad's got no gumption, no get up and go. He needs to get on his bike. Oh. Maybe he has found himself a job by now. I've heard nothing from any of them for months. When we did speak, Stephen had just gone about how I was responsible for everything that was going wrong. I don't know why I should take the blame. It seems like all of a sudden, opinions became very entrenched. And nobody can see the other person's point of view anymore. I suppose that's what comes of having to make a choice, one thing or t'other. Two extremes. There's no common ground. Of course, there's always been differences. But they've been magnified out of all proportion. And neither side has any respect for the other. Well, I know that there's always been them university types who look down on the likes of me who left school at 15. But now that we're calling the shots, their mild derision has turned into outright animosity. And it's torn this family in two. It's a tragedy, really. Stephen's wife hasn't helped. We've never seen eye to eye. Don't know why he couldn't have married a local girl. I'll tell you what. She definitely wears the trousers in that relationship. She's got him under her thumb. Good and proper. And it's often the way nowadays. She's what you'd call very highly strung. She throws a fit if she can't get her own way. Or if anybody dares to contradict her. So he's forever walking on eggshells so as not to upset her. Oh, I could tell you some stories about her. I wouldn't be surprised if he's under strict orders to give me the cold shoulder. Still, I'd think I'd call once in a while if only to speak to his mother. Not that we have anything in common with their generation. 
the younger ones I've known a time before this interweb, you know, Google, Face, Instamatic and all that. Stephen doesn't even have a real telephone. It's all smart telephones and tablets. Oh, the only tablets I know about are the ones I get on prescription. The march of technology. And we just can't keep up. For instance, it's not long since Claire used a typewriter. She used to have one of them heavy black iron jobs. <laughs> Made copies with carbon paper. <laughs> Still got a box in the attic. She used to write articles for Kurt Bright's monthly magazine while it lasted. And then I bought her one of them portable jobs. But even then, eventually, it became hard to get hold of the ribbon. Then she had uh, one of them electronical typewriters on trial, but she couldn't get on with it. Mind you, that's getting on for 40 years ago now. <laughs> Since then, there's been word processors and great big computers and and now you can do the same job on something the size of a cigar box. Now, I'm sure it's all for the best, but whichever way you look at it, there's a bigger distance between our generation and the younger ones than ever before. And I'm not just talking about technology and gadgets. I'm talking about attitudes as well. I was born in 1938 and my attitudes would have been pretty much set in stone by the late 50s. And these would have been more or less the same attitude and values that people had in the 1850s or the, or the 1750s. I mean, what I mean is... Well, they just hadn't changed for, well, centuries. Of course, I'm, I'm talking about Christian values. I suppose the church never had much trouble with new ideas. It kept things constant, preserved the old ways in aspic. You knew where you were. But then most people stopped going to church and everything changed. It started in the 60s. Um, not the swinging 60s ever made it this far north, but, but, but gradually these newfangled ideas started to creep in. And, and they kept changing faster and faster. And nowadays, you don't know what you're supposed to believe from one day to the next. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about attitudes to marriage and divorce and how you bring up your children, whether it's all right to smack them or not. Uh, occasional clout round the ear never did me any harm. No, Stephen, for that matter. Mind you, last time I clipped his ear, he clouted me back. And then there's attitudes to... The attitudes to abortion and to a woman's role in the home and to homosexuals and to coloreds and to smoking and to what you can and can't eat. And the latest thing is gender. There used to be two of them. Now there's at least half a dozen, so they say. And what are we supposed to call coloreds? That keeps changing. I can't keep up. And if you get it wrong, you don't have to get some black logs. Oh. Well, I suppose you can't say that now. For instance, I smoke Negro head pipe tobacco. Well, that's what it said on the tin, on account of it being all black and curly. And then they changed his name to Blackjack, 
only recently mined. I don't know why they can't leave things alone. Mind you, you can't get anything like the same range of pipe tobacco nowadays. Co-op won't stock it at all. I have to have it delivered in plain brown paper packages as if it's something to be ashamed of. Claire used to like the smell of my pipe. But then she changed with the times. It got to the stage where she wouldn't let me smoke in the house. Or even in the backyard if the wind were blowing in this direction. Mind you. She don't make such a fuss about it now. Dan and Roy were big pipe smokers as well. The three of us had get together in the snug at the plough. And by the end of the evening, the smoke was that thick, you couldn't see it at the far side of the room. <laughs> at least we gave the place some atmosphere, literally. <laughs> right, a bloody nuisance when they banned smoking in pubs. It's no fun sitting outside in all weathers. To my mind, a pipe and a pint just go together. It's natural. It's like bacon and eggs. It seems to me there's no greater proof of a divine creator than the way certain completely unrelated things just go together perfectly. Like um, fish and chips, Bread and butter, bangers and mash, or what have you. Anyway, we smokers suddenly became pariahs. It seemed to happen overnight. All that fuss about passive smoking. What about passive intolerance of other people's pleasures? Or opinions, come to think of it. <laughs> That's where it all started. They'd be banning eating red meat next. Here go underground. Black market black puddings. Under the counter lamb chops. Steak easies. <laughs> anyway, when we couldn't smoke inside anymore, we just stopped going down to the plough. Mind you, it's not as it was. It's what they call a gastro pub now. We thought we'd give it a try for our 60th wedding anniversary, but we weren't impressed. They seem to have put more effort into composing the menu than anything else. Every dish deserved a long paragraph. No ingredient went unmentioned. And each was preceded by at least a couple of adjectives. Snipped. Chinese chives, for God's sake. And they wouldn't leave you alone, asking if everything was all right every five minutes. I told them it would be if you just let us eat our dinner in peace. And to make matters worse, it's this new vel cuisine. Give me all vel cuisine any day of the week. Apart from anything else, the portions were tiny. Claire said at least it wouldn't give anybody a heart attack. Though the bill just might. And when we were done, I was still hungry. I had to pop into the kebab shop next door. No wonder they do a roaring trade. The plough used to be bulging at the seams on a Saturday night. Nowadays, half my neighbours are Muslims, they, they wouldn't be seen dead in a pub, so you can see why the place couldn't survive as it was. There's no real sense of community now, or not in the local meaning of the word. The young ones have their communities on the interweb, but that's no help if you can't make head and a tail of it. Even before this lockdown, the kids stay inside using this sociable media. They don't even watch TV anymore. Not that we had TV when I was growing up. 
Claire and I had been in this house a few years before we got our first set. 1966, just in time for World Cup. Oh, oh that was a good year. People used to say that TV killed the art of conversation. But if anything, it gave us something to talk about. When there were only two or three channels and nearly everyone watched the same things. Nowadays, there's dozens of channels and not worth watching. I, I've got no time for this reality TV. Well, they make out it's real, but it's all very contrived. And, you know, most of the time, you just feel you're being duped. It was wireless when I was lad. I used to listen to Billy Cotton Band Show, Hancock's Half Hour, uh, Dick Barton's Special Agent, Round the Horn, and Al Reed. Oh, all gone. All gone. If you compare my childhood with my grandchildren's, They've got absolutely nothing in common. I'd be down the woods, building dens, climbing trees, fishing for tiddlers, <laughs> oils out on my bike with Eric and Cyril. They were my two best mates from school. Both of them long gone now. Anyway, these were more or less the same things that my dad had done when he was a lad and his dad before him. And now, everything's changed. There's a new housing estate where the woods were. And if you want to get out in the countryside, you've got to get on the bypass or else try to negotiate that massive roundabout. Neither are safe for a kid on a bike. I blame the planners. They couldn't have done a worse job if they deliberately set out to ruin the town. The town centre is virtually unrecognisable now. Especially now they've knocked down the market hall and put up that new shopping centre. All the old family-owned businesses have gone. And the only shops in the high street are chains. So you might as well have been in any other town in the country. Someone once said that Buildings are the theatre of memory, or something like that. But if I look back at the buildings that were important in my life, you know, I can't think of a single one left standing. So all I've got left are the memories, and as often as not, no one to share them with. Apart from Claire. House I were bought up in went in the 70s. <laughs> they levelled the whole street. They said it was a slum. Unfit for human habitation. And then they put up a tower block in its place. And that is certainly unfit for human habitation. Lifts that stink of piss. Dreadful condensation. And now all that fuss about the cladding. Give me the old terraces any day. Even if we didn't have an indoor privy. At least we had our own front door and our own backyard. There's none of these soulless corridors with graffiti plastered walls and smelling of other folks cooking. My old school is now what they call an academy. Oh, I was telling Claire, last time I walked past, I noticed a new sign outside. And under the name of the school, it had got what they call a tagline. A high achieving community, high achieving multicultural community for learning. For all the good that I do. Schools didn't need taglines in my day. The place is unrecognisable. The Victorian buildings have all been replaced by glass boxes. 
Oh, it's all glass and steel and concrete nowadays. They're such unfriendly materials. What's the matter with brick and stone and slate? You can hold a brick in your hand. These new buildings have got no human scale. And, and they've turned their back on everything that went before. They're plain ugly. And, and these new materials don't weather at all well. If anything, a traditional building looked even better as time went by. But the new ones, they looked all streaked and grubby after a year or two. When Kirk Bryant's went, they tore down the old workshop and built a new multi-storey car park, more concrete, of course. Then there's a Ladbrokes where the old social club used to be. Mind you, round here, every other shop's either a bookmaker's or a fried chicken place. That tells you something. Even the old library's a, an Indian restaurant now. The youth club where Claire and I first met, that went in the 80s. Even the building went when they built that new mosque. The ABC cinema where we used to go courting, that's been replaced by a tanning boutique and health spa. And the church where we got married and where they christened our Stephen, that was turned into flats. They say we leave footprints in the sands of time. I, I get the impression there's someone following me with a brush, sweeping away every trace I was ever here. All gone. All gone. I really need to do something about these meals on wheels. Claire's lost her enthusiasm for cooking. And the best I can do is open a tin. She doesn't even do the laundry now. That was always her province. I can't make her not tell of that machine, so I, I just do what I can in the bath. I try to make stuff last. <laughs> she, she, she was always too eager to throw things in the linen box when they had plenty of life left in them. She had that machine going five days a week. A bit daft when there's just two of us. I used to say it was one of her hobbies. Playing cards, reading, hiking and laundering. <laughs> oh, she's given most of them up now. She didn't even get round with the duster as often as she used to. Mind you, I'm not complaining. A bit of dust never did anybody any harm. At least I can tell from the thickness of the dust how long something's been put down. <laughs> and hiking's out of the question now in my hip. It's a major expedition to get to the end of the street. She didn't even read much now. I found one of her library books under the sofa last week. I could tell from the dust it had been there for a while. I noticed it was nearly 12 months overdue. Mind you, now the library's gone, I can't even return it. We used to play cards with the golden oldies, mostly whist and canasta. And then when it was down to just the two of us, we played gin rummy and cribbage. Mind you, players lost her enthusiasm for cards. Now I come to think of it, she's lost her enthusiasm for most things. <laughs> but we do talk a lot. Well, I do most of the talking, but she's a very good listener. I don't know what I'd do without her. I still get the cards out, but mostly I just play on my own these days. Well, it passes the time. No, that's quite all right. 
you just sit and watch. Oh, that's fine. Oh. Oh, that's fine. I'm glad of the company. <laughs>